Hi, welcome to week four. We're almost there. Um, this week, I the text covers marriage and family pretty well, so I'll post some notes in the um, uh, course content folder to guide your reading. So there won't be a video lecture on that. Um, this lecture is on the chapter education and religion. Okay, so the first thing to note is that education is a social institution. It's one of the institutions and therefore like religion is an institution uh, both of great interest to sociologists. Now looking at education as an institution and how it works with large groups of people moving through it, um, there is a nice synopsis in your book of the three theoretical lenses that you can look through and I'm just going to very briefly recap those. Um, the first one is a functionalist theorist would look for manifest functions, latent functions, and dysfunctions when they looked at education. Um, I'll give you some examples a little later. A conflict theorist would ask what role does our system of education play in the economy? And specifically does it promote or prevent uh, economic inequality? That's the conflict theory. Is it, conflict theory is always about economics and usually inequality, economic inequality. A symbolic interactionist would ask, how do schools socialize children? Remember socialization? Schools are important agents of socialization. And what exactly are they being socialized into? Um, an interesting point, have you ever wondered why school, think, think elementary school here, have you ever wondered why elementary school is the way it is? Um, most schools, there's a bell to tell you when class starts and when class ends, when you can go to recess, when you can come back into recess. If it's not a bell, sometimes it's a whistle. Um, this was modeled during industrialization on the factory whistle, which could be heard all over town. That's when the day started for all the people. So students originally in elementary school were being socialized into the working hours that corresponded to the factory work day. And here are some other things uh, that we call the hidden curriculum. Other things that are taught besides the ABCs that students learn very early on in our educational system. Uh, rules and hierarchy. Students learn that there are rules and that you have to follow them. That is specifically to get them used to that acceptance of authority that comes with being a factory worker. Um, the foreman says do it this way, you do it that way, or you're out of a job. So the socialization that the schools were providing originally were intended to get the kids used to it early and continue it to prepare them for the workforce. At one time you have to remember just about most jobs were factory jobs. Um, and what's the one thing that's really really stressed in, um, in elementary school, actually all the way up to high school, attendance. Well, that's what the factory owner wants. He doesn't want you as a worker if you don't know how to get up every morning and go to work. So a symbolic interactionist would look at the socialization that's going on and why it is the way it is, what does it produce, what effect does it have on people. And so that's an example of how symbolic interactionism would look at the institution of education. It would look not at how you were being taught math, but at the hidden curriculum and the socialization that's going on. Now you can read about uh, tracking where they decide who's bright and who's not, put different labels on them. It can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's well covered in the book. Um, testing and differences in test scores, how test scores have gone down even though they play with the numbers and the text will show you how they play with the numbers. Uh, to make it look higher than it actually is. Um, grade inflation is a problem. We think we're doing better than we actually are. Um, the text points that out, gives you some numbers on it. Um, 
and generally covers those issues pretty well. So here's some things, just a few things that aren't in the text that I thought you might be curious about and that might appear on a test. Um, people often ask, you know, public schools get such a, a bad rap. They really do. And people ask, are charter schools better? Are private religious schools better? And the answer to this, we've got about 20 years of research on it now, is not really. They're not really better. Um, and especially with charter schools, there are some interesting um, challenges that are faced. You have to have a really upstanding group of people running that school because the profit motive can undermine it. Um, charter schools are funded by taxpayers, but they can also collect money from parents directly. There are run like for profit institutions where the parents are the shareholders. But here's the challenge parents don't have teacher training. There is something to doing K 12 teaching that parent, most parents have not been trained in. So, parent input is fantastic, of course, but you don't want uh, things like complete control by parents who know nothing about teaching or, or education or have no experience teaching. Um, the, it's detrimental. And it's not necessarily better at best. Um, but normal parent involvement, of course, is excellent and always to be encouraged. Um, several researchers have compared the test results from private religious schools, charter schools, and public schools over the years and have found that they are basically average out the same. Some, some schools, you might know a particular charter school which is better or a particular public school that is better, or a particular religious school that truly is better. But if you take them all as an average, look at the group, you know, they produce a bell curve, which is pretty much the same across the institution. So uh, charter schools and private religious schools are not magic bullets that will solve the educational uh, issues. One real crisis that we have in education is the move towards privatization especially of, of both K-12 and higher education. And the, the issue with privatization in higher education is again, the profit motive is such a temptation to be corrupt. That sounds so awful, but when you think about it a minute, if you want, if you're running your school like a business that wants to make a profit, what do you need to do? Well, you better give out lots of A's so that you have satisfied customers. And they'll tell their friends and bring in more satisfied customers, believing that the students are doing superior work because they have an A. But if you look in the text, you'll see the many explanations for why grade inflation is actually, uh, they, in the text they call it dumbing down America, by awarding high grades for average work. So an A is not really an A anymore and will pretty soon become meaningless. Um, that's, the, that's the issue with privatization, is that profit motive, it gives too much of an incentive for um, uh, grade inflation and other educational practices that might be good for business, but bad for learning. And businesses are very good at marketing and they're very good at covering up these issues in public discourse and in the media. But it's something to watch out for if you're a concerned parent. Um, you know, what's going on behind the scenes with this privatization of education move. Um, so the traditional definition of an A is the top 10% of the grade distribution, which is a 90 or above. K to 12 schools have, especially high schools, have done things discussed in the text like social promotion where they move you ahead a grade even though you can't read because your friends are in the other grade and they don't want you to feel left out and you haven't learned the skills. So we've developed this culture of sort of moving people along and telling them that we're doing, they're doing great because we don't want them to feel bad but as a result they're not learning the material and our competitiveness in the world economy and in the domestic economy is failing. We're importing workers from other countries with engineering degrees, science degrees, um, 
uh, policy analysts uh, because the actual skill level, you, today you can look at somebody who has a transcript full of A's and you put them on the job and the employer will be very dissatisfied because they didn't actually master the skills and they'll end up job hopping until they find their niche. Um, C is not, a C is not an F. Uh, that's another thing in student culture. C means average. It means you did the assignment and you did it well enough and you performed average, 70% to 79% on the grade scale. Um, B means above average. A B is a good thing, not a bad thing. An A is excellent by definition. Now, when you see some numbers that are pumped out by different uh, schools and you see that, you know, 40% of the students are getting an A, I bet if you took those students and actually gave them a skills test, you would find out that 40% of them were not doing excellent work. Um, so grade inflation is a real issue, not only in K-12, but in higher education. And it's used uh, politically. Um, as evidence, hey, our school is great, look at all the A's, but are they really doing excellent work? It's a tricky issue. Um, so you can further read about concepts like tracking and education in other countries in the text. Um, so I want to move on from here into the other half of the chapter, which is religion. Now, so sociologists uh, don't take an evaluative view of religion. In other words, as a sociologist, it's not my job to decide what religion is right, what religion is wrong, what religion is true, what religion is false. If I'm studying uh, natives on a Pacific island and they believe there's a vol volcano god, I don't care if there is one or not, or if they can prove it or not. I just care how it affects their society, how that belief affects their, affects their society. I'm interested in what the reality for them is. And that's how sociologists uh, uh, approach religion. We're interested in the effects on society that it has. We're not interested in, you know, what's true and what's false. We're interested in reality. What's, what's going on in social reality, I should say. Okay, um, Durkheim wrote a groundbreaking book called Elementary Forms of Religious Life. He went to many different societies all around the world and looked at their religious lives and he found great diversity, great diversity. If you look in your text, you'll have it broken down for you, the kinds of diversity that he finds. Um, he defines religion as the realm of the sacred or the supernatural, as opposed to the profane, which doesn't mean cussing. Profane in this context means the world of the everyday, the ordinary. So a church for, in our society, a church would be a sacred space. A mosque is a sacred space. Um, a ceremonial ground for Native Americans is a sacred space. The grocery store is a profane or secular place. It means associated with everyday life. And that's how he defined uh, religion. The two most important latent functions of religion for Durkheim, and you have to remember this is the guy that came up with functionalism pretty much, were that it promotes shared beliefs, values, and gatherings at events. This is very important for Durkheim. He, he makes this point over and over in his book, Elementary Forms of Religious Life, that a sp certain feeling arises at these events, and this feeling, this religious feeling, this sort of transcend in transcendence that comes from being in a group sharing spiritual experience produces a solidarity between the people who are participating. And so he saw religion as promoting social cohesion through shared values, beliefs, and events where people got together and this religious feeling arises, the spiritual feeling arises, and binds the community together. So that's how, that's his main take, or a summary of his main take.
on how religion holds society together. Um, another very interesting book, a classic, is Max Weber. That's W-E-B-E-R, but he's German, so it's pronounced Weber. Um, Max Weber's classic book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Now, Weber doesn't really fit in with either functionalist or uh, conflict theory, really. Um, he's sort of a hybrid. He's, he's more interested in, in organizations and how they work, and it, he just doesn't fit neatly. So you can think of Max Weber as sort of outside of our three major theories. Um, in his book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, he showed that religion served such an important function during that it made the Industrial Revolution and the rise of the economic system of capitalism possible, and that it strengthened capitalism. So religion strengthened the economy at this time. And he said this was not because of any business reason. He said this was driven by religious beliefs, specifically the beliefs of Calvinists which, it, that's a Protestant Christian denomination, Calvinists, uh, associated with Northern Europe, and Scandinavia also. So here's the basics. This is what the Calvinists believe, and a lot of them immigrated to the U.S., and capitalism took off in the U.S. immediately, um, in part inspired by these religious beliefs. So a Calvinist believed that only a certain number of predestined people were going to heaven. Now here's the problem. You didn't know if you were one of them. Everybody was nervous about that. Now how, here's how their logic went. How could you tell if you were one of those predestined to go to heaven? Well, if you're predestined and you're chosen, God must be treating you well. Therefore, you would be prosperous a.k.a. wealthy. So if you want to know who's going to heaven, look for the wealthy people because God blessed them with prosperity, material prosperity. That was their logic. Now, you can imagine what the message of this was to people in that society. If you, you better work hard reinvest your money, don't spend frivolously, live simply, and reinvest in your business, and then you will be prosperous, and then you'll know that God chose you. So it's religion driving the economy, not the other way around. Um, and this produced a really vigorous capitalist economy in uh, England and the U.S. during industrialization. Um, and it was completely driven by re religious not, beliefs. Um, I shouldn't say completely, largely, largely, let me qualify that, largely. In Weber's view, I think if, if we were able to go back in time and ask Weber about it, Weber would probably say that without that ethic, you wouldn't have a strong capitalism as early as you have it. Okay. Now, a conflict theorist turns all of that on their heads, pretty much. They view religion, remember, as the top of that pyramid of the way they conceive of society as mystification or an ideology that is used to explain to people why they are where they are in the economic system, to explain why there is so social inequality and why that's okay. Um, it distracts people away from the true reasons for economic inequality or justifies the system of inequality. So the conflict theorist looks at religion as an epiphenomena, something that arises from the structure to justify the distribution of rewards within the structure, specifically economic rewards. A conflict theory would view the Hindu caste system as a good example of this. Um, although the caste system has been outlawed in India, it's a centuries-old tradition and people still, society is still based on it, even though technically um, it's not in the, the legal code anymore. People, this is their culture. The caste society has five different 
castes that you're born into. And you can only do the work for that caste. The highest caste is the Brahmin. Um, those are the priests, the scholars. Um, today, traditionally, today uh, there are the upper upper class, the professionals, the doctors, the lawyers. They are Brahmin. They are the top. They are not allowed to take a job beneath their caste. So if, if you're born into a Brahmin family and you want to be a plumber, forget it. You'll be a complete social outcast and you'll be born into a lower caste in your next life. They believe in reincarnation. Or you might even come back as a bug. It's very frowned upon. So the next caste were warriors, traditionally warriors, um, soldiers, and it goes on like that on down to each each of the five castes has occupations associated with it and a level of wealth associated with it till so you get to the bottom to the Dalits who are known as the untouchables. Um, they're the only people in society who are allowed to touch the dead so it's their job to do all kinds of things associated with funerals. They're also the only ones allowed to touch garbage so they're the garbage keepers. Now if you're born into that family and let's say you're really really good at math and physics and you want to be a theoretical physicist you can pretty much forget that one because you can't even people will not associate none of the other castes they're even forbidden to touch a dolly even to pat them on the back to say hello um, they can't even touch someone of a higher caste or they will uh, make that person ritually unclean and they'll have to go to the temple and take care of that. So what would Marx say about the Hindu religion? He would say this ideology that you are reincarnated in a series of steps from the untouchables all the way up to the Brahmins um, as you go through human existence um, is an ideology that keeps everyone in their place it impedes social mobility and it does not it does not encourage social mobility and it does not encourage social change and um, it's called the caste system the, the caste system um, is a mystification that encourages social stratification and so you can see conflict theory has a very different way of looking at that um, one thing to think about would be maybe how would a conflict theorist interpret Hinduism? So I'll leave you with that question and I'll see you next lecture.